And I, it, it's only weird, like I said, for someone who creates a weird little distinct category called religion, a category that they don't understand, a category that, that they can just like uh, count off as superstitious and stupid and ridiculous, although it's a human universal, and it makes them feel safe that they don't have to understand this, and then it makes them blind to all these other behaviors that humans have that are ritualized and that could be really understood if they took a little bit of time. This is Jonathan Peugeot. Welcome to the Symbolic World. Two weeks ago now, I'm not even sure time really flies. Some guy that I never heard of who runs a podcast called Decoding the Gurus, I guess, uh, kind of went after me on Twitter. At first he was going after Brett Weinstein, but then decided, I guess, to go after me. And uh, anyways, he he has the usual kind of, you know, dismissive new atheist tone. And I was going to ignore the guy. But then uh, David Fuller from Rebel Wisdom and uh, other people that I respect, you know, said that uh, this is important that I should pay attention to it. But really, I'm not going to I'm not going to answer too much. But one of the things that this guy uh, attacked me on is here's one of the tweets he said, He's uh, talking to David Fuller and he says here, Jonathan Peugeot saying Alex Jones intuition are absolutely correct that abortion is a human sacrifice for power and that he would not be at all surprised if the elites were engaged in, in ritual sacrifices. And so this was, of course, his big proof that I am uh, off, that I am off the rails, that I'm some kind of guru or some, you know, that I, that I'm not worth uh, the attention and so what I thought is, I realized in reading it that, of course, this, I don't think this guy could understand what I'm talking about, but I thought it could be a good opportunity to maybe talk about sacrifice and maybe help people understand as much as I can help you understand what sacrifice is, why we sacrifice, and even why human sacrifice exists. And we'll see if in the end that, uh, that tweet or these comments that I made about abortion and human sacrifice hold up once we've gone through the basic, uh, the basic ideas. One of the issues that we see with a lot of these kind of new atheist uh, types and this kind of new atheist rhetoric is that they often act as if religion is this thing completely set aside in human behavior. And so they create a box called religion and then they look at what's going on there and they, they, uh, they just see it as some kind of aberration or some kind of strange behavior that humans are having. And because they don't, they don't seem to want to connect the ritual, uh, let's say, religious behavior with other types of behavior or other types of regular behavior that humans have, then they find it very strange when other people do that. When I, let's say, if I try to explain how certain behaviors today are akin to sacrifice, I've done this not only in terms of abortion but in terms of. In terms of war, for example, I've talked about uh, how we'll get, we'll get to it. I've talked about how certain acts in war are very much akin to human sacrifice, um, and so that's the problem. It makes it very difficult to engage with these types of people because they're not really trying to understand why people would sacrifice in the first place. How did this happen? How did humans start to sacrifice? Once you start to ask those questions, then all of a sudden you get larger categories of human behavior and you can, you're able to understand why it would happen that sacrifice would be developed and why it is delusional. It, it really would be a strange delusion to notice that sacrifice is a human universal, but that today, for some reason, we don't do that anymore. Nobody does that anymore. Nobody sacrifices. And of course, nobody uh, uh, participates in human sacrifice because, you know, we're so evolved that we would never do something like that. But I think that's really the blindness of not understanding what sacrifice is, what, what it's for. And so we're going to look at that and see if we can figure out on our side why it is that uh, sacrifice exists. Now, in order to understand sacrifice, we really need to go back down into very, very primal categories of what humans do because 
sacrifice is a very, very, is a large and encompassing uh, category. And several thinkers have been poking at it and trying to find solutions at why humans do this. Different uh, theor uh, anthropologists or, or religious thinkers have tried to kind of figure out why it is that humans do this. Um, and I'm going to give you my take at it. I don't necessarily think that it's all encompassing, but I do think that it does encompass quite a bit of why it is we could get to, the, get to this. Now, we have to go all the way back, all the way to the very bottom of activity, of what, uh, an, uh, let's say, what a being with agency does and why it does what it does. And the way that I try to think about it that brings it all together is to understand that most of what we do, or possibly everything that a being with agency does, has two basic goals. Um, and it has, these goals have to do with identity. They have to do with the notion of being a being rather than not, right? To just existing as a being is what we have to come down to in order to understand sacrifice. So we understand that when beings act in the world, they act for two major reasons. One is to protect the integrity of my being, and the other is to expand my being. Now, expand my being can be something like adding body, adding potential. But of course, when we get to conscious beings and to higher uh, level beings, we'll see that that also has to do with something like influence. It can also be a more subtle type of expansion, not necessarily also, a, not necessarily just a physical uh, expansion, but a more subtle one. And we also can understand that expansion of being, even as something as lineage, you know, as something like my children as an extension of my being, and that my children become an extension of me, and so I, I can act in a manner to, to protect and to expand the things that are related to my being. We'll see how that scales up also rather quickly into higher beings even than humans in terms of families um, and, and different higher beings. So we get to this basic idea. So why is it that I engage with the world? You know, I either try to, to stop things from hurting me, to prevent things from destroying the integrity of what I am, or I'm also either expanding myself or taking things from the outside and bringing them inside in order to preserve and to expand what I am. Um, so we get now to, because we're going to talk about mostly about sacrifice in terms of killing animals, but there are other types of sacrifice. But we're going to start with there. It makes more sense. So the question is, why do we kill things? You know, why would humans kill things? And when you think about it the way that I explained it, you realize that humans kill things for those reasons. Human Humans kill things either to protect themselves. So, right, there's a predator, there's something attacking me, you know, there's a, there's a mosquito biting me, there's whatever it is that is attacking me. And so I will kill the thing in order to, to preserve my body, or I also kill things in order to integrate them for food and to expand my body. But I could also kill things in, in, in order to expand my influence and my presence as well, right? If there is a predator hunting on my on on my land and he's killing the animals that I want to kill, then I might kill that predator in order to have more access and to expand my my scope, my influence, you know, my my capacity to take up to 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 exist in the world. Let's say. Um, so you see that, of course, it's not just killing anything we do, whether it's the, you know, the grass we pull out of the ground, whether it's the wood we cut, will always be about this as well. And you can then scale that up and you can understand that this is what, this is what happens when you kill people as well. When you kill people, you will do it for those reasons. You will do it either to protect yourself, if there's someone attacking me, if there's someone dangerous to me, I feel like I have to kill them in order to preserve my being, or I will also kill in order to expand, to take things from others, to invade other lands. You know, if I'm jealous of someone, I want to take what they have, or at least want to eliminate them as rivals for what we're both looking for. So you're gonna to start to see that I think that my theory about sacrifice is ultimately going to be more encompassing even than Girard's uh, theory. I think so. It might be a little cocky on my on my end to say that, uh, but we'll see. You'll see that I think that it 
it, it involves. But looking at René Girard's theory is, is of course, extremely uh, useful to help you understand. But first, we also can also understand that we have to ask ourselves, first of all, how we engage with things outside, and then also, why would we give things to others? So because sacrifice involves those two things. It involves taking things from the outside, taking, you know, either killing things or taking uh, different things that we've gathered and giving them to others. So why would we do that? And my, my, uh, I surmise that the reason why we do that is the same as why we kill and take things in the first place, is we do it either to, you know, expand ourselves or to protect ourselves. But then the expanding and protecting happens. Humans, one of the things that humans realize is that they also exist at higher levels. They also exist in groups. They exist in higher level beings, let's say. They don't only exist. They exist in families and clans and all of this. They don't only exist on their own. And so they'll realize that as an individual being, it will at some point be worth sacrificing what I have, giving away what, I, what I've gathered, giving away what I've killed in order to assure at now a higher level the same thing, the preservation or expansion of the, the higher layer level beings that I participate in, whether it's my clan, my family, whether it's a group, and then ultimately whether it's a nation. We'll also see that that sacrifice will kind of happen uh, in two directions, we could say. One going up, or maybe three directions. Let's say one going up, one going down, and then one maybe going side to side in terms of gift giving with friends. So the one going up will be something like, uh, you know, something uh, that you see already in the animal world, which is that if a pack of wolves kill, uh, kill something, then the alpha wolf will have first access to the food. So there's a sense in which we understand that when we exist in higher level uh, structures, we have to give a part up into that structure in order to preserve the, the preserve the strength of the common being. And so the king gets a part of what I make. You know, this is what taxes are. Taxes are basically a form of sacrifice where we offer up to the higher being, which is the king or the state or something which is above us, in order to preserve our existence, to expand our influence. Now this, you'll realize that once once humans realize that this works, that if I give a part of what I have up towards, towards a higher level being, my family, my team, my clan, or whatever, that this can also be ritualized and can be given up to the reason why we exist in the first place. So this is what giving, giving things to a god is. It, it's actually a more economic way of all of us binding together and giving a part of what we have up, up towards the ideal of why we exist together so that, it, that that ideal will then come back down and will, let's say, um, will hold us together in a way that, that, that binds us. But we'll see a little more about that as we go. First, I want to look a little more at the, Girard's theory. Now, Girard's theory is wonderful because he kind of gets what I'm saying and he realizes that in order for groups to exist together, they have to care for the same things. And this is actually the very existence of, an, of a group. I mentioned this before. In order for a group to exist, we have to have one purpose or one ideal, any group, whether it's you know, a group of pe people working on a prototype in a company, whether it's a, a baseball team or whatever, sports team, or they, there is something, there is something we care about, all of us care about, that binds us towards that care, binds us towards that thing. Now, you can imagine that there are multiple things that can do that, and there can also be a hierarchy of things. So we, we let's say we care about certain things, and then at a lower levels, we also care about secondary goods as well. So we can understand that in a group, certain things become valuable, certain resources, you know, women, children, all these things become valuable. And then because we all care for the same things, then it binds us together, but it creates, of course, a problem. Because when we care for the same things, the resources are limited. 
the possibility of accessing these things that we care about are limited as well. So what will happen is that we'll create rivalry and competition within the group. And so the very thing that binds us will create competition and rivalry. And so this is a serious problem because what it can do is it can lead to all-out conflict where everybody starts ripping each other apart through, through cycles of revenge. You know, I, I'm jealous of my neighbor, so I kill him to take his wife or to take his stuff, but then his family notice, see that I did that, then they take revenge on me. And so you have these eternal cycles of revenge. And so we have to find ways to com continue to cohere or else groups will just fall, fall apart and cease to exist. And this will happen through ritualized behavior. And so just like, you know, just like a, a dog will ritualize a conflict in order to avoid killing each other, they will ritualize uh, aggression, ritualize submission, and then they'll create a ritualized encounter in order to avoid the cost of it boiling down all the way into all behavior. For the same reasons, humans also do that. It's, it, there's nothing weird even for an atheist to understand that ritualized behavior is a, is a way in, in which to avoid the cost of a certain uh, social dynamic and to, to bring it higher, into, bring it up to its pattern in a manner in which it will then, let's say, order reality and not be as costly in the, in, at, the, at the bottom of things. Um, so what Gerard noticed is that what people would tend to do is that they would take all the problems in the tribe, all of the things that were breaking the tribe apart, and they would end up focusing it, finding someone who was weak, who was diseased, or someone who uh, just didn't fit in. Sometimes it would actually be a stranger, like an enemy prisoner, someone who's not part of the group, or is almost not part of the group. And then they would say, well, it's because of that person. It's because of this person that the group isn't going together, right? It's a scapegoat behavior. So they would, they would put all the blame on the person, the, the, the scapegoat. They would say that it's this person's fault that I'm not able, that we are not able to reach what it is we care about because they, they are in the way. They're not, they're not, they're oddly not, bind, they're not binding the group. They're not participating in the manner in which the group binds together. They would put all the blame on that person. They would kill that person and then it would rebind them towards what it is that they cared about. They would, it would create a kind of ecstasy and a, um, it would create a kind of an ecstasy and a kind of moment where the group would feel in acting together in violence towards the scapegoat that they recognize each other as one. They recognize each other as being something that exists in the world. Um, this, is, this, is, um, this is difficult to understand for people who think that groups just exist. Groups don't just exist. Beings don't just exist. They need something to bind them together for them to exist. And that has a mechanism. And if you don't understand it, then there's a lot of stuff about religion that you will never understand because you, you somehow think that people just exist together without ways to bind in order for them to, 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 to move towards common uh, goals and common things that they care about. Um, so what you, what you realize is that this Girard's theory works very with perfectly with my idea that basically the way in which a group acts will be a way in, to act in order to bind themselves. It has to do with identity in, in binding and creating a hierarchy and identifying an outside, right? We, we take something on the edge, we take something strange, we, we kill it, we basically cast it out and then that ejects that which is not good, that which is outside of us in a ritual way, and it binds us together towards something. Um, and so you can do that, of course. You can understand that this is already what happens in the very existence of the group, in the patterning of attention. This is what is already happening. That is in order, of, you know, I, I've mentioned this before, let's say in order for a basketball team to exist as a basketball team, it has to be able to sacrifice. It has to be able to focus its attention on a common goal, to identify the things that are the obstacles to which for to reach that goal, and then to eliminate them. And so if there's a bad player on the team, they will get rid of the bad player. 
if there's bad behavior on the team, then they will eliminate behavior. And so you realize that actually sacrifice is the very way in which things exist. This for anything to exist, it has to sacrifice some aspect of its idiosyncrasy in order for it to exist together. And this is gonna sound weird for people to understand, but in order for you to understand the existence of objects, of, of any being, you realize that the pattern of sacrifice is embedded in the very existence of all objects. Because even though I recognize this as being a cup, it has indefinite idiosyncrasy in it, which, is, which could make it not a cup, that is not participating in, in its cupness, you could say. But in order for me to recognize it as a cup, I have to sacrifice the idiosyncrasy, even in my attention. I have to, I have to not pay attention to the things that are idiosyncratic in the object so that I can experience it and participate it in it in a way that is to its purpose, in the way in which it is to the, the reason why I care about this thing in the first place, which is that I use it to drink out of. Um, now, of course, there are ways to play with this. There, the, the, this isn't, there are ways in which sometimes a little bit of, of, uh, of idiosyncrasy is part of the pattern. We've talked about this in other videos. I won't go into it right now, but as a basic pattern, we have to understand that that is how things exist, through sacrificing idiosyncrasy. And also, let's say, the, the, the different aspects of the group have to give aspects of themselves up in order to participate in their higher being. All right, so it's a good way to understand emergence in general. All right, so we understand that this is the basic idea of how Girard works, and you can understand it as a good way of understanding how all things exist. And the idea is that mimetic sacrifice, the way that Girard defines it, is useful, but I think that Girard really focuses on the scapegoat part, but what you realize is that there are many types of sacrifices which will participate in things existing, and they don't all fit with the notion of mimetic sacrifice. You can understand, like I've said, the, the idea of giving up, right? The idea of giving up towards our identity is not exactly the same as mimetic sacrifice. So we, we get, taxes is the best way to understand sacrifice up the hierarchy towards, towards higher level beings, um, but there's also a way in which we sacrifice down, in which the higher level beings will also give part of itself down to the lower beings. I've mentioned this before. You see that, of course, in the idea of the emperor giving bread to the masses. You know, you see that also in the sense of, let's say, the state offering uh, services to the people. And so taking that which has which is had, it has received, but also not just using it for its own self-existence, it has to give back down towards the group. So imagine a king, for example, that takes taxes, and then the king doesn't do anything for the people. At some point, they're gonna kill the king. At some point, they're gonna get rid of him. But if the king offers protection and offers that which I talked about in the outset, which is to maintain the identity of the group, to maintain it towards a purpose that the group cares about, then people will accept to give up to the higher being in order to receive back down a kind of order, a kind of structure um, and protection from the outside. And so, but the king has to offer that. He has to sacrifice back down towards the group in order for the, so there, this is the type of exchange that happens. Um, so you can see that often in the uh, ritualized sacrifices, you'll see that this is happening at the same time where someone will take an animal that is usually you know, a good animal, like the best animal, something unblemished or something, and they will give up towards the God that binds the group together, but then that will already immediately come back down on them, and then they will eat the meat of the sacrifice. And so we give up, and then we receive at the same time. And this might seem weird for people because they think, you know, it's like, why are you giving it up to God? Why don't you just eat the animal? But we have to understand that Ritual behavior is a way to bind us towards a common purpose and towards a common reason why we exist together. And so when we know that everybody is doing this, everybody is offering up a sacrifice to the thing that binds us together, to the identity that binds us together, and then ritually we then all engage in the bounty that that offers us, 
then we are binding each other to binding together as a community. So this is this is uh, I know people are now I know atheists are going to freak out. They're going to be like, "What? This doesn't make any sense." But you have to understand it fractally. You have to understand it. That this is what we do all the time, right? We Imagine a family, you you invite your family over for dinner and then everybody brings a, a meal, everybody brings some food, everybody brings a dish. And then we all put it together towards the thing that binds us together, which is that we are a family and we exist together with a common care and a common identity and a common purpose. And then as we all put that together, and we offer it up to the to our family, then it comes back down and we sit at a table and then we celebrate. What are we celebrating? We're celebrating our family. We're celebrating the thing that binds us together. And so we, we, we offer up food, we sit together at a table, and then we eat together. And you say, well, why don't you just sit at home and just eat, just take food and eat it, you know? Why would you do something like that? And this is where people don't, like I said, people are ignorant of why it is that humans exist together in the first place. And so ritual sacrifice that is offered up to a god is one level higher than the type of behavior that you engage with when you are getting together as a family for Thanksgiving and everybody bringing some food and then eating together, you know? And there's a and it's and it's important because if you don't eat the food, then your family is, it's a, it will be an image of your family not being together, by the way. I hope you know that, right? If your aunt brings some food and nobody eats the food that the one aunt brings, then that will uh, reflect the manner in which her sacrifice is not accepted. Her sacrifice is rejected and that she is not, so, not really bound together in the proper way. And you know that that's true, by the way, if you have a family that you actually care about, you realize that this is something you have to think about. Um, and so you can see that, so you can see different versions of this. You can realize that the, there, there are different types of ways in which this happens. So for example, ritualized manners in which you give towards authorities in order to avoid the problems. The best way to understand it is of course the tribute because you imagine that a, a king comes into your land. He's not really your king yet. And he basically demands tribute. He says, give me this amount every year. And why is he saying that? It's a racket, right? He's saying that because he's, it's protection money. He's saying, pay me this, this amount every year. And if you don't, then I will come and I will pillage your land and I will rape your women and I will take your children. And so the ritualization of the behavior will avoid the cost of it at the ground. It will avoid the king having to have his soldiers die. It will avoid the people having their people died and killed and raped. And it will become a ritualized manner in which we sacrifice one part of what we have up to this higher level authority that is coming to us in order to, in order to, to, uh, to impose its authority on us. So this is not good or bad, guys. This is not about sacrificing is good, sacrificing is bad. It's just about how the world works. This is how the world works and you can't get away from it. This is, this is just the manner in which, you, in which, in which it works. Um, and so it helps you really see the double-sidedness of, of all of these authorities, of all civilization, of all of the manner in which uh, authority structures exist are always double-sided. You can see the positive aspect in, in which, you know, the idea that the king will cover you and will protect you or the state will cover you and will protect you in order to in order to hold your identity together, but you can also see it, how it can become tyrannical and it can be a, uh, basically protection money uh, that you have to pay or else they're gonna put you in jail. So pay your taxes or else you go to jail, even if you don't believe at some point authority becomes inescapable in the world. Um, all right, and so we have to then understand that the, the, there's a diff, direct relationship if you see that you, there's a relationship between human sacrifice and war, you know, you can see that when you fight a war, once again, people think that identities exist, just, just exist. They don't just exist. I have an identity. I have a city. I have a clan. I have things, a group of people that I identify as having one identity. And now all of a sudden, that group that I identify as one is threatened by a group on the outside. Now, why do I care? 
Why don't I just give in and cease to exist and become part of that other group? Because I care about these things. I care because also if I am taken over by another group, I will lose the, the value of what binds me together. I'll become a slave for the other group. I'll become a lower part of the, the group that's attacking me. And so I want to preserve my identity. I want to preserve the identity of my group. And so I understand in war that I am willing, because I don't know what's going to happen, right? If I, am a, if I am a group and I'm attacking another group in order to expand my identity, expand my power, expand my influence, expand my glory, uh, I don't even know, I don't know what's going to happen, but I, I am betting on the future that I am willing to sacrifice members of my group in order to reach that goal that I care about. And the same goes for the protective side. I'm being attacked by another group. Why don't we just scatter? Why don't we just run away? Why don't we just, why don't we just you know, uh, cease to exist? And I'm like, no, I want to continue to exist. And I am willing to sacrifice members of my group. I'm willing to kill them for this higher purpose in order to continue to exist as a group. And so there's a, com there's a direct relationship between war and human sacrifice. And we understand it if you look at the different rituals that happened and the manner in which human sacrifice was practiced in different civilizations, you will, re you will realize that that is the case. You will realize in the things that we recognize more, let's say more directly as being human sacrifice, which is the notion of uh, ritually killing someone in a, in a very formal way, that it is just a way to avoid the cost of of the, the, the normal protection and let's say expansion of my identity. And so that is why, for example, you can understand that, let's say when the Romans took over Gaul, took over a certain amount of, of, uh, of the country, they realized that they also don't want to totally decimate the other people and take over their land. There's something, that it's not even to their advantage to do that because those are resources that they, that they want to use. So in order to mark their authority, in order to stop the killing, one of the things that they will do is that they would they would sacrifice their enemies. So they would take some people, some some of the leaders, or they would take a certain amount of people from the uh, from the enemy group, and they would ritually kill them in order to mark their the way, the manner in which they ruled that group, in order to mark the expansion of their authority, to declare it, to say we have. We have taken over this, this land. We have taken over this people. We've taken over this power. And you see that this happens in many, uh, many uh, civilizations where the killing of a slave, for example, or the killing of an enemy, a captured enemy, is part of the behavior because they want to mark the, their power on the other, but they also want to limit the cost. They don't want to just slaughter everybody. Um, and this is real politic, guys. Like I'm not, I'm not uh, skimming, skimping at w how the world works. Um, but what you realize is that sacrifice is inevitable. You know, that it is part of identity itself. And once you realize this, you realize that it also explains a lot of other types of sacrifices, which is, for example, the sacrifice of food. And so sometimes we, uh, it doesn't have to always have to be meat. It could be grain. It could be all kinds of things. The pouring out of libations, all these types of sacrifices will be ritualized ways of marking a giving up, either up towards the, the higher purpose of the group in order for all of us to recognize that we are bound to this, to this, um, it's about attention, that we are bound to this purpose or down. Sometimes you also give down to, to your fallen ones. You know, this idea of pouring one out for the, lost, for the lost ones where you pour out a drink on the ground in order to commemorate the dead. Uh, you can understand that this is also a manner in which to preserve the memory of our group, to preserve the idea that we are together by remembering those that are fallen and creating, once again, this sense of cohesion, not just in space, but also in time with the people that, were, that preceded us. And so giving out food to the dead is a manner in which we can remain bound to them through the, all, through the sacrifice of something that is precious to us, all right?
All right, so I'm not going through all of it, but hopefully you're starting to see how this is, how this works, and how why it is that sacrifice is part of of human reality. In the the, the ritualized sacrifice, you end up having different types of sacrifices. You can imagine that, in terms, of, especially in terms of human sacrifice, you can imagine that there is the scapegoat sacrifice that I talked about, but that there's also like the sacrifice to found a city. So you realize that a lot of civilizations participate in human sacrifices in order to found cities, in order also to found houses. So you find under houses, the under posts, let's say, that hold up houses, you will find human remains of people that were killed or sacrificed and put under the house of in order to hold the house up. So of course we're all materialists, we're all we're all uh, scientists, and so we think that that's superstitious. Why would you kill someone and put them under the post of a house to hold up the house? And this is of course where we struggle to understand different types of causality. We don't understand that if you make if you put something precious as the foundation of your home, if you sacrifice something precious in order to bind even a building together, even uh, even even a family together, then that will hold it, and it will it will hold it not through weird, superstitious means. It will hold it through attention. It will hold it through the knowing of of of. And there's it it can become quite subtle, but nonetheless, there's even if just the person that does something like that understand what they what they paid, the price that they're paying in order to exist together in a home, in a house, in order for things to, to bind together, then they will do it. Now, I'm not trying to defend human sacrifice. I obviously do not do not uh, believe in human sacrifice. I'm a Christian. I think that the, the story of Christ has solved the problem of human sacrifice because there is something itchy about it. And we realize that, we realize uh, as we look at how it develops and moves towards animal sacrifice and then moves ultimately towards uh, more subtle forms of sacrifice, that there's a refining of the sacrifice uh, system. But to, to simply deny it and think that it's completely, it, it makes absolutely no sense, and not to understand that uh, why it is that, why it exists, is also being extremely naive and not understanding how it works. Um, and so you can understand how people would sacrifice things in order to get from higher authorities and that would could be ritualized into the sacrifice to uh, a god a sacrifice to a god in the sense of the god as the principality as the top of what it is that binds us together and so just to to go back over what we talked about just in terms of going back over the idea that there are different levels of ritualization in killing all killing is is to a certain extent ritualized because it is done with a purpose and therefore has to be done towards that purpose, but there are different levels of ritualizations, of course, uh, in killing, and you can understand how this is what happens in the animal kingdom itself, where it's, it's and, and even you can realize that it's not just even about killing. Sometimes you don't even kill. Sometimes you can create the pattern of sacrifice in a manner which is dedication, and so you see that in... Um, in scripture, for example, where people would dedicate themselves and uh, to the temple, for example, you see that in, in scripture where you know, someone is given to God and that person lives in the temple and then becomes a servant of the temple. The idea that uh, you, know, you would give up your, your men to, or, to be in the army and so you give up at least one of your sons will become a priest, for example. These are ways in which we understand that when we talk about even human sacrifice, it doesn't necessarily mean that someone has to die, but it means that that we give up someone to a higher good, and then that binds us together. So the idea of, of um, let's say, you know, this idea in Catholic countries where every family kind of had to have one uh, member of their family uh, become a priest, let's say, was this kind of giving up towards a higher purpose. Um, but of course you see that even just in animal in animal uh, in animal behavior, where an, an animal is killed, and then the best part of that killed animal will be given up towards the uh, the, the alpha male. Let's say um, we talk about scapegoat ca- sacrifices, and we have this idea, for example, in scripture that the firstborn is dedicated to God, 
And you can understand how in some cultures, this type of thinking would lead to actually killing your firstborn, which seems crazy to us. But we have a sense in which the firstborn has to kind of embody in a way the highest ideal of our family. And I know that this is going to sound weird, but there's a sense in which the best part is given up towards the, 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 the ideal. And so that's where you can see why, that's where you can understand also why there is that in, in war, why we have the sense in which we give up our best men in order for them to, to fight and to die for the cause of our nation. This, there's, there's very little difference between the two. It's just that one is more ritualized, let's say, than the other, um, and will usually also lead to less killing because in a war, there is ritualization, but it can become very messy. And, you, and the number of people that die, and the number, of people, the number of people that end up getting sacrificed for the unity of our group is much larger than, than in human sacrifice. So you can understand why in human sacrifice, there was a way in which this was a, a way to have an economic way of killing in order to attain the goal that something like war ends up attaining. Um, all right, and so you can understand how in different cultures then there would be, there would also be initiation sacrifices. And so uh, there are many examples of that. For example, the Spartans, when the, uh, the Spartan uh, citizens reach a certain age of initiation, one of the things that they would do is there would be a certain amount of time in which they were, it was fair game to kill any servant in the land. And so the Spartans would go out and they would murder as many serfs and as many, um, as many slaves as they could in order to mark their capacity to be a Spartan. It was an initiation sacrifice. We see that, of course, in different uh, gang initiations and the legends of gangs initiations. Some of them are maybe not actually embodied, but the stories of them still kind of imbibe our culture. You know, you have this idea that if you're a member of the Aryan Brotherhood or whatever, you have to kill a rival in order to participate, in order to be a member. Sometimes you don't necessarily have to kill to be a member, but if you do kill a rival gang member, or if you kill someone from another gang, or if you even kill an innocent person, then that will make you go up in the hierarchy. That it becomes a form of marking the outside by killing that which is outside or eliminating something which is weak inside the group, a rival that you're able to beat in order to make the group stronger and to bind you together. Um, and there's also a manner in which acting in that scandalous way, this is something that you see in mimetic, in a mimetic sacrifice, is that there's something about doing something horrible, like killing another human being that you recognize as being a mirror of you, right? You, humans are different from animals because you see in their face a mirror of yourself. And so the idea that to, to, to go into something as scandalous as killing another human being and doing it as a group or doing it for a group becomes the ultimate marker of participating in a scandal by which we exist together. This is, of course, especially true in criminal organizations where the idea that if you're willing to kill someone in order to be part of this group, then we can trust your, we can trust the fact that you care about our group more than anything else, that this is what you, you completely uh, care about. And so killing becomes a very powerful tool for any kind of uh, criminal syndicate. It, it offers all kinds of solutions to the problem of existing in an illegitimate and, a, and a, uh, in something which is illegal and something which is criminal is that if you get people to kill others or you make it part of the way in which you scale up the, the hierarchy of a criminal organization, then you are not only participating in a scandalous act together, but you are, you are also making them dependent on you because you know that they killed someone and that this binds them to you in ways that are more than one, let's say, you know, by, part, by knowing about this person's scandal, then they also become, they owe you because you could always denounce them. You know, you, you, you share something together, which is the knowledge that you've all killed someone together. Uh, you've all killed someone. So these are all ways in which uh, initiation sacrifices are a way of uh, 
participating in human sacrifice that that works. Like it, it actually works in order to bind a group together. It's horrible, uh, but it works. And so you realize that in the Gospel of St. John, you have actually a you act you actually have a uh, very short definition of what it is that sacrifice is, human sacrifice especially, and you have it when uh, when the uh, the Sanhedrin are questioning, are wondering what to do about this Jesus fellow, and because they can see that Jesus is causing problems, you know, through the the turning over of the, the, the tables in the temple, through the resurrection of Lazarus, he's attracting a lot of attention, to himself, to the Jews, they're scared of the Romans, they're scared about also the people, what the people are seeing and how it's, it's, it's destabilizing their group. And so, you know, the, one of the members of the Sanhedrin says, you do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. And so the idea of being able to eliminate one person you know, by for, by the Sanhedrin killing this one person, they would be one marking their allegiance to Rome by saying we're denouncing a traitor, right? They're also binding themselves together by participating in killing this ultimately innocent person. All of this is happening at the same time. They realize that by doing this, then they will bind themselves together. And so in this case, of course, you realize that in many civilizations, this type of function, when you realize that until very recently, the executions were always public. So the public execution is a way, is, is another form of human sacrifice, where we kill someone in public, we make sure everybody sees that, and we realize that by doing that, we are going to mark the limit of behavior in our society in a very dramatic and, and, uh, and powerful way. Of course, uh, political assassinations are that as well. We realize that if I can just kill this member of this enemy team, of this enemy group, of this enemy nation, if I can just kill bin Laden, then there'll be less bloodshed. So I will, we will bind together to kill this one person in order to bind, to, to preserve the identity of our group because we realize that if we do that, then we don't have to go to war. We are, the war that we are having with the other people is going to be diminished by killing the, the, these few people, let's say. And this is going to be very controversial. But there is a manner in which the, the, the watching of George Floyd dying, the killing of George Floyd, ended up being something like a human sacrifice. It ended up being something like someone dying and then binding care together and trying to create a social cohesion under the death of one person. So George Floyd gets killed and then people, massive people all over the world demonstrate in the street for days and days and weeks. Cities, you know, there's a sense in which there's this catharsis which happens that is exactly the type of catharsis that would happen in any in any kind of human sacrifice, but strangely enough, it's 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 actually closer to the Christian version of of human sacrifice because there is a serious problem with sacrifice, you know, and what it does because it is nonetheless the ritual. There's something which, when we look into the face of another human being and we see that mirror, there's something about killing someone else which is very different, like I said, from killing an animal. And so there's a manner in which it seems like in human culture, there was something bubbling. There was something bubbling up to help us understand that there's something off about the manner in which we, we do that. There's something in the, the, the reflection of myself in the other, which makes this type of behavior something unacceptable. And this is, of course, what ultimately leads to, this is what, why René Girard says that the fact that in the story of Jesus Christ, we see the ritual scapegoat sacrifice from the point of view of the one who is sacrificed, that it actually collapses and completely resolves in a manner the problem and the reality of the scapegoat sacrifice. Because the victim 
of scapegoat sacrificing is often innocent because the problem of desire is there in the group. And so we, the fact that we throw all our, the sins of the group onto one person is, of course, too much for that person to bear. And this is, this is a, it's, a, it's somewhat like a, a momentary binding, but it's a cycle, like it's this constant cycle of, uh, you have to keep doing that over and over in order to refresh and to rebind you together. Now, in the Christian story, we have a sense in which as we take the place of the sacrificed one, as we, we take the position of the sacrificed one, then it, it is actually revealing the mechanism of the scapegoat sacrifice and in a way heals it or recasts it in a different manner. Um, and it also, I've talked about this before, it actually exposes a, a secret about reality, which is that the true manner in which things bind together and hold together is through self-sacrifice. It is not through sacrificing other things, although it works. But ultimately, we realize that it is, if I want my family to bind together, I have to sacrifice my idiosyncrasies to the common goal. I have to give myself to the love that exists in my family. And that is the proper way for a family to exist. I could find a, a, a black sheep in the family. We could have one of the the child, one of our many children in the in the the family represents the black sheep. They're always to blame. It's always their fault. It's always they're the ones who are responsible for all our woes, and it works. Right? It actually will bind you together, but it will leave this residue, this dark residue on the outside. And what that does is it it creates the cycle where it has to. We have to keep this black sheep there, or recast it into someone else in order for the group to continue to exist. What what the Christian story reveals is that the proper way, the best way for a group to exist is that if we all, if we all sacrifice ourselves towards the love that we have together, let's say in a family, then that will be the proper way for the group to exist. And it will be a, a more, a stronger way and a, a healthier way for a group to bind together. And so what we see in the George Floyd thing is weird version of this position where now the victim is elevated and now the victim becomes that which binds people towards a common purpose and is policy making it actually leads policy you know laws were changed budgets were changed things were realigned in the wake of people watching George Floyd George Floyd die and so if you don't think that that's a kind of human sacrifice, I don't know what to tell you because it worked. It, I mean, it worked in the sense that it created one person dying, changed laws all over the United States. So you can bicker and tell me that I'm, I'm being, uh, I'm exaggerating and saying that it's, it was, it's participating in the pattern of human sacrifice. But then why is it changing things? Why is it actually rebinding society towards different purposes? How did it do that if it doesn't, if it's not effective? It, if if one person dying doesn't, can't change the way society or redirect or rebind or recast society, I don't know what to tell you. Once you also start to see it this way, you realize that the modern geopolitical world is based on several sacrifices, but two very large human sacrifices. And the stability of the modern world is based on two sacrifices, one which was the Holocaust, which even uses language of sacrifice. We continue to say the Holocaust, in, and I'm sure that our atheist friends won't dare use another word be, besides uh, Holocaust. Why? Because you don't get to decide whether or not it works that way. And so the, 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 the Holocaust functions as a rebinding of society, where living in that, in the, in the fact of that sacrifice, I'm not just, it's not about justifying it. It's about what it does, what effect it had. And so we constantly remember, we remember the Holocaust has become part of the narrative which holds the Western world together, that we did this, remembering that we did this, that the, that the West did this, that, that, that some people were willing to go this far as to kill all these innocents. And, we, we, and it, it 
created international law. It created all these things that bind us. But there's another one too, and which is, which of course, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's a classic example of human sacrifice because the United States calculated, they don't know what's going to happen. The United States don't know the future. They can't completely tell the future. But they realize that if we kill these innocent people, if we destroy entire cities, then we make a bet that it will rebind us together at a higher level, that it will stop the war. I mean, that is exactly what ritualized sacrifice is. We, we, we calculate that if we engage in this one ritual act of slaughtering innocents, thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of innocents, then it will heal us and we will, and it will rebind our society. Now, I don't, I am scandalized by, by, by both of these. But I can, I'm not stupid enough. I'm, I'm smart enough to realize that it worked, that it happened, that, that it, and it participates exactly in the pattern of, of human sacrifice that, was, that, would, that happened thousands of years ago. There's no difference uh, in terms of the pattern. There's only a difference if you want to create a weird, you know, autonomous category called religion. But if you don't, then you realize that it works and that it happened. And so, first of all, let's look then at abortion. What is abortion? Abortion is exactly the same thing. Abortion is exactly that. Someone, someone gets pregnant. And now they have something that they care about. They have a purpose. They have something which they think is important and which binds their being towards a purpose. And all of a sudden, something gets in the way. This, 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 this burgeoning human in them gets in the way, and they don't know what the future. How could you know the future? You don't know what's going to happen. But they make a bet, and they identify the, the, the fetus, they identify the child in their body as the cause of why they're not going to be able to reach their goal. They identify it as something which is, is the reason, it's the scapegoat. It's exactly what a scapegoat sacrifice is. They're, they're saying it's that thing's fault. It's that person's fault. And they dehumanize the, the, the fetus. Like it's that, it's, it's, it's the fetus's fault that I'm not going to be able to accomplish my purpose and my goal. And so I will sacrifice it to my purpose and once I get rid of that, of the reason why I can't reach my purpose, then I'm rebound towards the purpose which I had in the first place. And so I don't know what to say. I mean, I don't know what to say besides that it participates in the same pattern. It's just, it's just a, it's not re understood as religious. It doesn't matter, but it nonetheless participates in the same pattern. And so, Let's get to the second part of the tweet that I said, that I wouldn't be surprised if elites engage in ritualized human sacrifice. Now, I'm not saying that they do. I don't know if they do. I'm saying I wouldn't be surprised if they did. And why would I not be surprised if they did? Because I look around me and I see that criminal syndicates use killing as initiation methods. They've used it for thousands of years, whether it's the Spartans or whether it's the Hells Angels, they use killing as initiation mechanisms. And, and I'm not saying that all the elites function as uh, criminal syndicates, but there are certainly some elites that function as criminal syndicates. And to the extent that they function as criminal organizations and syndicates, and they use the same patterns and structures as, as the mob or the mafia or, or, or other criminal syndicates, then why would I be surprised that they, used, that they would use killing as initiation sacrifices? I mean, I don't know if they do, but I wouldn't be surprised if they did because it's a human universal. And you see it in civilizations that date thousands of years ago, and you see it in the streets of big cities today. And so I don't, I don't see why that's weird. And I, it, it's only weird, like I said, for someone who creates a weird little distinct category called religion, 
a category that they don't understand, a category that, that they can just like uh, count off as superstitious and stupid and ridiculous, although it's a human universal, and it makes them feel safe that they don't have to understand this, and then it makes them blind to all these other behaviors that humans have that are ritualized and that could be really understood if they took a little bit of time to understand uh, to understand what religious, what they call religious uh, behaviors are. And so hopefully this was scandalous enough for you, and uh, but helpful also to understand that this isn't, there's no taboos. We're not, we're not going to pretend, you know, we need to understand why humans do certain things. And if we can understand it, then it will help us also understand the best version of that. Because I believe the Christian story is the best version of that. I believe the true sacrifice is self-sacrifice. And, and I can explain why, and I can tell you why, and I can see it as the, the culmination and the reversal of this whole pattern of sacrifice. But if you don't try to understand it, and you can't tell me why you think self-sacrifice, and you believe it for some amorphous, strange reason that nobody understands why it, why it is the most important, then before you know it, you're gonna be calling for the death of who knows what scapegoat that you're going to find. Whether right now we can kind of see it coming up again, where you know, Facebook has allowed us to wish for the death of people of a certain nation. And we just do that without realizing that once again, and whether whether they are responsible or not responsible, you know, like I, I want I don't certainly don't want to defend what's what they're doing right now, but but nonetheless, it's still participating in this pattern. And we think that we are we are somehow anyways. It's good to try to understand what sacrifice is, and it was helpful to uh, to understand a lot of symbolic behavior. So hopefully this has been useful, and um, and yeah, so we'll talk to you very soon. As you know, the symbolic world is not just a bunch of videos on YouTube. We are also a podcast, which you can find on your uh, usual podcast platform, but we also have a website with a blog and several very interesting articles by very intelligent people that have been thinking about symbolism on all kinds of subjects. We also have a Clips channel, a Facebook group. You know, there's a whole lot of ways that you can get more involved in the exploration and the discussion of symbolism. Don't forget that my brother Mathieu wrote a book called The Language of Creation, which is a very powerful synthesis of a lot of the ideas that explore. And so please uh, go ahead and explore this world. You can also participate by you know, buying things that I've designed, t-shirts with different designs on them. And you can also support this podcast and these videos through PayPal or through Patreon. Everybody who supports me has access to an extra video a month. And there are also all kinds of other goodies and tiers that you can get involved with. So everybody, thank you again. And uh, thank you for your support.